So on the last uh, video, there was an issue where I was trying to put the O-ring into the um, housing, but the O-ring, for some reason, that came with the kit was too large, and when I tried to crush that in there, um, the casting just ended up breaking. So what I ended up doing there is uh, I, I basically just soldered on some aluminum fix or weld or whatever, cleaned up the surface, uh, used a die grinder and, you know, opened it up a little bit more. And it looks like it's sealed up. I mean, there, it wasn't a surface that's pressurized, um, but, you know, it, it just basically is, I welded some stuff in there just to kind of keep it held together a little bit better. So right here, I, I still haven't learned my lesson. I'm trying to use the O-ring that they supplied me, and then I grabbed my O-ring kit, and that did not work at all. And so in a few minutes, what you'll end up seeing is me grabbing the O-ring from the uh, the original O-ring that was there. And it, it seems to be a little bit you know, angled, and I thought it was angled because it was crushed a bit too much, but I guess it's not. But regardless, what I did is I cleaned up the area with a little bit of acetone, and um, used a little bit of um, RTV and with that you know it should seal up the surface just fine so a little bit of RTV around the o-ring which is still pliable should seal up that surface so that's what I ended up doing instead of you know crushing the casing once again So right here in this part, I'm using a little bit of Hylomar um, sealant. It's kind of a, it's kind of a more pliable. It doesn't harden up, and it's used, you know, as kind of a. I don't know. It, it some people, some people just like it when you when you use just the paper gasket. But to be honest, I think that um, it can't hurt, and it definitely can help. And so I add it to both surfaces, especially when it comes to, you know, paper gaskets. It actually leaves it a little bit easier to um, remove in some cases. And it just, you know, deals with the imperfections. Um, I know that I did use the wire wheel, but you can see it's, a, it's cast uh, iron. 
and the wire wheel that I used was um, I'm pretty sure the wire wheel I use is, is brass, you know, something really, really light. And so it, it, it didn't harm the surface area, but it, it is, you know, a couple decades old and it's gone through some, you know, wear and tear and corrosion one way or another. And so using a little bit of that Hylomar um, is just a little bit of insurance just to make sure things are sealed up nicely. So right here, you're going to see me torquing these up. Um, so this is the, the crankcase ventilation or, you know, it's the oil separated a little bit. So it goes from the, the bottom end to the, the top end of the engine. Um, I'm looking at the torque settings and I'm thinking I'm, you know, being a little bit proactive about it. Uh, I looked at the torque settings, but I didn't, uh, I didn't remember that the uh, injection pump actually rests on there or, or it attaches on there. And so two or three of those um, bolts had to come out. So no need to torque at this point, but I guess I did. So at this point right here, that's where your um, injection, <clears throat> or sorry, your um, vacuum pump connects to. I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm actually going to block that off completely, and um, I'm going to use an electric vacuum pump. I just don't want any variables. I've never seen them go wrong or go bad, but it is, you know, connecting to one of the lobes on the camshaft. If it seizes up, if it goes out, if it, you know, self-destructs it can take out the engine. <clears throat> Whereas an electric one, you know, it doesn't do any harm. Uh, worst case scenario, you've just got no vacuum. Now, in this part right here, I'm actually just, uh, I was kind of, I'm, I'm kind of proud of my, my work here. And so what I'm doing is just writing um, my initials and the date of the, the rebuild, just uh, for uh, posterity, let's say. So right here, I'm just putting in a little bit of Teflon tape um, just to seal up those surfaces a little bit better. It's, um, it's solvent resistant Teflon tape. <clears throat> so right here at this point, I'm bringing in the um, new head that came in from England. Um, supposedly they're, I mean, they got good reviews. It was a decent price. And, you know, the cost that it would have taken me to bring a head that, I mean, it seemed the old head was okay, supposedly, and it seemed fine, but the cost to have it machined and sorted out and maybe like a valve here and then 
you know, doing the valve guides and, and checking everything out and all the tolerances, it would have been almost the price of a new head. And these new heads, so the 300 TDIs kind of have issues with um, the cooling system. The, the passages just aren't large enough, and so the head can overheat kind of easily. So these upgraded 300 TDI heads supposedly have, you know, the, the ports are a lot larger. And so that the risk of overheating um, isn't as high. So this one right here, so the reason why I was using the old uh, head for a second is that I was pulling off the um, old um, studs for the um, the injection, the fuel injectors, and then also I was pulling out the support brackets to hold the engine. Uh, you can tell it's kind of warped and kind of used and abused. So I'm going to, in a little bit, you know, use the hammer, use the old mallet, straighten it out as, to the best of my abilities, and then um, use the wire wheel along with um, finger sander to, you know, get it a little bit uh, more presentable.
So this point right here, what I'm doing is, you know, using cold bluing. Anybody that's watched any restoration videos or anything knows very well what cold bluing is. It's just a controlled oxidation that actually just creates a barrier um, from the surface to, to it, it stops the rust by, you know, controlling a, a kind of a rusty rust reaction uh, immediately. And so it keeps it from going forward. I personally, to be honest, I, I'm not the biggest fan of it. I know it, it looks really, really cool, but in reality, I, every time I've done cold bluing, if it sees, you know, one rainstorm, you know, one little amount of any sort of weather, it, it'll immediately start rusting. So I'm kind of reluctantly doing this, and uh, I think later on, most of the things that I ended up doing cold bluing to, um, I ended up painting or covering up. So, I mean, cold bluing is actually good for areas kind of under under the engine, under the hood, that don't see weather. And so they just get like a little bit of moisture just from, you know, being outside, but not, it doesn't deal with like, you know, the elements. And so cold bluing, I guess in that case, would be kind of a good idea. Um, or, or stuff that, you know, is indoors. Here, <clears throat> I actually bought a new injection pump and I, I was surprised to get it. it. It came from Germany and it was a rebuild and I didn't look too into it. It turns out that that injection pump is for another, I think it's for the non-turbo um, Land Rover diesel engines. I just, it came up from the search term that I was looking up and I just saw, you know, Bosch, Land Rover, diesel and clicked buy. And it's, <clears throat> I bought it so long ago that I don't even want to return it, even if it was to be a U.S. seller, but this seller in particular was from Germany. It's my fault. I should have looked, you know, further into it. But, um, yeah, so if anybody is interested in a uh, nicely refurbished um, non-turbo Land Rover injection pump, uh, you know a guy. And honestly, to be fair, so this engine that I've pulled, I think I've mentioned this a few times, this engine came from a, a UK Defender 90, like a 97, um, 300 TDI with um, the R380 um, transmission. Um, and it came from a running truck. Um, so everything here, I mean, quite honestly, I could have just dropped this into my truck and it would theoretically run. I just decided to do this because, you know, it's already out and I wanted to do a rebuild and I wanted to, you know, get to the guts of it and understand things a little bit better. Um, right here is the, 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 the pin that actually, you know, drops. You'll see it's kind of concaved. There's a pin that actually hits that area on the um, injection pump and that's what actually kind of tells the turbo when to start spooling up. So you can actually make, they, they make them for like 10 bucks or something, a, a, a pin that's, you know, got a, a steeper uh, decline which forces the turbo to kick on a little bit earlier and it's really it actually does make a difference so I do have that and I, I am gonna do that pin swap um, I've already done it but uh, later in the video Now I know that the um, the ultrasonic cleaner is always kind of running in the background. I, I love this little guy. It is, you know, tried and tested. I mean, what I actually do, my mix is just like some regular industrial kind of cleaner, 20%, um, like then like 70% uh, water, a little bit of Dawn dish soap, just a couple drops, and then also uh, some uh, rust remover 
uh, just a little bit of that. And so that kind of makes, to me, just makes it, you know, work really, really well. Um, I do end up like pulling it out, wire wheeling it, cleaning it up a little bit, um, sometimes using a sander to just get rid of um, kind of the casting marks. But, you know, after a couple of, you know, runs with uh, the ultrasonic, it just cleans up really, really nicely. You'll see um, later on toward the end of this how, just how clean and nice it looks. I ordered some new ones. I just cleaned these up and uh, cold blued them just to see what it was like, just to see if it was worth it. I mean, this one I had to chop off because it, um, the nut kind of um, <clears throat> cleared the threads halfway through so I couldn't get it out. Regardless, I mean, it was like $28 to $30 to get some, some new ones, so. Anyway, these are, I don't know. I'm not gonna throw them away just in case, but three are more than likely good. One would be all right if I needed to. 
you know? I mean, there's enough thread there to do that, and then I could test them to see if they work, but I'm pretty sure they do, regardless, for such a, you know, <clears throat> very little money. Put in a whole new set. Let's put these away just in case. Paint it blue or red only after I torque it. Um, so I'm tightening it down, but if you see it blue or red, that means I torqued it. So right there, I'm putting in the studs that actually hold um, the rocker um, shaft or tube. Um, and then they also act, so the studs hold the rocker tube and then um, also the um, valve cover. Now, right here, what I'm doing is actually putting on, uh, the, those are the studs actually for the fuel injectors um, and and so you'll see me put those in there and then um, crimp them with two nuts I think they're M8 1.25 uh, nuts to just get it snugged up um, along with some Loctite and that that Loctite that I've got I love it's like it's the red Loctite and it's kind of in uh, like a, a, a baton like a baton like a like a lipstick type thing you know so it actually just is always available it's not drizzle all over the place and uh, right here what I'm doing is actually um, staking down um, the pins that the um, it's actually the the fulcrum point for the uh, um, what pinches down the uh, fuel injectors Right there, I can see I'm pretty proud of myself and kind of just showing off that, look, it's the surface is clean. I don't know why. Um, I'm also grabbing, uh, it's the straightest of an edge I can get, and I, I'm just running, um, zigzagging and crossing to make sure that um, the surface is pretty um, flat, and it is, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, you'll see me start chiming in talking about the difference between the Victor Ryan's gasket and the Brit Park gasket. 
and um, which one I should use. Um, so I looked into it and kind of talked to people on Facebook and, uh, you know, well, you'll see. Can't find the other dowel pin. Something close. Same diameter outside. All it really is is just a little locator. I don't want to stop the job in the middle and wait for days to get one. So I think I'm just going to chop this guy up. Now I know this isn't optimal and the dowel pin is just so easy to get um, and so cheap. The problem is, is that it just takes time. I was in the middle of doing something and all these dowel pins are, are nothing more than a locator, right? So it's not, to me personally, it's not a big deal at all. And I don't think it's a hodgepodge type situation. It's basically, you're creating a little area, a little piece of metal in order for the head to drop into. And so, so long as the head can drop into that and work just fine, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, that's a. Does anybody here know where that logo's from? The dowel pin stayed on the head, but it doesn't matter. This is the one that came with the new head. This is one I bought not knowing that it came with it. it doesn't say where this guy's made. It's a three hole. This one is. It usually should say, right? Hmm. Ryan's is five six seven mil. Rip part is seven mil. Same thing. So the Victor Ryan's is a three hole gasket and to be fair I'm going to go with the Victor Ryan's. It's just <clears throat> I don't know, made in Spain, seems like it's got a higher standard. I hate against the brick part, but... So at this point I'm just checking all my work, making sure everything is nice and clean, everything's going correctly, making sure the surfaces are nice and sorted out. Um, I might crank over the engine one more time just to make sure everything's good. You know, drop in a little bit more oil in there. This is the last time that these kind of areas, nooks and crannies of the engine is going to see oil until the oil pump starts, you know, running its, its process. So I just want to make sure that it's got as much lube as it possibly can and no um, surface areas that 
you know, no metal meets metal without any oil in between. I'm, <clears throat> I'm also pretty happy that as I'm cranking over the engine, you can see that um, it's, the cylinder walls are being scraped pretty evenly. Um, you see a couple little lines there, but that's actually just a little bit of oil um, just going down in, in a straight stream. But everything's nice and clean. So right here, you actually start seeing me color code a whole bunch of stuff. And a lot of um, people might wonder, you know, what is he doing? So like a lot of like, um, these are torque to yield bolts. They're one time use. Um, another thing is that they're kind of made or, or the, the manual calls for the torque to be or, or the, the pattern in order to tighten the bolts, the head bolts is pretty common but it's also a big pain in the butt um, because if you lose your train of thought or you forget which one's which you might actually you know run into a lot of trouble <clears throat> so what do i do i actually just if there if there are certain um bolts that need to be torqued to different specs i color code them differently so um in this instance there 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 are two sets of of, of torque that you need to apply need to right here I want to do something else though because it's just I think it's a bad design to have <clears throat> something that's ancillary you know it's something that's just not essential So right here, I'm just barely just um, quote unquote finger tightening it with um, the impact. Um, I'm also going back to what I was talking about with uh, um, putting the color coding. I just want to basically make sure that it's kind of foolproof. So first thing that I'm doing is using, I'm pretty sure the, the white marker to number all of the head bolts the same way the manual is calling for. The second thing, once so the manual calls for torquing it to a specific setting, then after that you have to. See, we've got one, well, I'm two, sorry, I'm interrupting three, myself. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18 40 newton meters everything else another 60 degrees I got another 60 degrees and then a few of them 20 degrees.
That's my zero. That's forty-five. So anyway, just a just a final point. What I'm trying to do is just color code um, the torque settings um, in the degrees. So I'll just do. You can establish zero at any point you want. Just make sure they're all the same at the zero on the head itself, and then another zero at the bolt. And then they'll just have to match at 60 degrees and 60 degrees, and the ones that go a farther, 20 degrees, um, just mark those. So use, you know, at least three different colors, and you'll be fine. For the 20 degrees on the other right. okay one two seven eight nine ten fifteen six seven eight. I don't know if it makes much sense to anybody else, <clears throat> but I just numbered them all, you know, 1 through 18. And then the white line, you see that right there on 10, is was the zero position. And the blue line right there, 60 degrees, and then another 60 degrees. See the little blue right there at the bottom where this blue ends is the other 20 degrees only for the ones that were um, saying that you needed to do another 20 degrees. That's the best way that I've done it, but whatever. I'm sure there are people that would disagree. Um, but that way, like this one on 18, I didn't get it tight enough. And I saw that the, the white line right there was right here on the red which was the second pass of the 60 degree. So then I just, oh, it, it doesn't match. So that's an easy way for me to like, oh, if I forgot, you know, that's confirmed. So now I've got the white here, the white on the blue, be the 60 plus 60 plus 20. And then on the other ones, on the red, it's only two passes right here, right here right here right here on the red red that one needs to go a little bit more right there see so I'm just able to catch that stuff so I just want to give a quick preview of like the video that I'm trying to put together um, next um, it's not so much of a mechanic video or, or putting together the engine it's actually talking about why you know the defender is or the 300 TDI defender is such an, a like an iconic vehicle it's not just you know um, like a cool retro vehicle, but because it can survive, you know, an EMP explosion, um, it can really, you know, be the ultimate apocalypse vehicle, you know, uh, and so I was kind of, I'm kind of going into, and these are kind of some of the, the documents and charts that I'm, I'm putting together and kind of just showing just how important or how, you know, horrible these EMP blasts can be and a vehicle that can survive that sort of, um, situation and also being four wheel drive and also run on a fuel like diesel, which lasts a lot longer than gasoline is essential. So look out for that. Um, I would appreciate you liking, subscribing, commenting. I'm trying to, you know, this is a new channel. I'm trying to make things a little bit better, a little bit more understandable. Um, I appreciate, you know, anybody who's watching it, anybody who's made it this far, you know, thanks very much. And uh, see you on the next time.